pass it over to Mark Stanley will take us through these delights. <laughs> Cheers, bud. Thank you. Hello, fellow geeks. Um, I'm here to talk about homebrew, so it's a bit of a crowd pleaser, hopefully. Um, everyone. <laughs> so, um, my name's Mark. I've spoken here once before. This is my second go. Um, I'm going to talk about why brewing. Um, so, when I started brewing, I was how old? How old are you? Twelve. No, I was, I was about. Um, I was. Uh, I was definitely older than 15 when I started brewing. Um, but the, the reason, the incentive behind it was for cost. Um, but you'll see as, as we go through, things have evolved slightly. But the cost side of things, um, the starter kit that I used, and I've checked the prices, these are current as at the weekend. Um, for about 20 quid, you can buy all the gear you need um, to actually start brewing. And then you have to buy a brew kit yourself which is sort of 12 to 25 quid if you are thinking of starting brewing um woodford wherry is uh, a very good kit to start with uh, very good results with that um so as a starter as a student uh, first pints were sort of a pound a pint and then subsequently with each kit it's sort of 40p a pint which is uh, a lot better than any student union or even a weatherspoons or dare i say it, a grown-up pub um, did, you, did you basically write off your cost after Yes. So they went into that pound of pint. They went into so that pound of pint. Your yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So um, the, the, these days, obviously, um, money's not quite such a pressure. And uh, I brew more for fun. And because you've got control, really. Uh, so, is anyone here a control freak? Or am I <laughs> preaching to the crowd? So, um, you can... <laughs> control geek, I like that. So, if you brew it yourself, you've got complete control over the ingredients. Um, these are the different stages of the brew process that I will go through. You also get to learn some new words, like sparge. Um, but you can control each of these processes and really control the output. And I would argue that you can make a beer as good as any beer that you can buy in any pub um, with relative ease. So my kit um, was about 300 quid to buy the extra stuff. Uh, a mash ton. I'll show you pictures of these. Don't worry. Um, kettle is a big kettle, not just an expensive kettle. It's a kettle that will deal with about 30 litres of liquid something called a work cooler and then rather than use a beer kit um, I buy my own malt uh, buy my own hops and buy my own yeast uh, the water I get for free um, so I use tap water yeah yeah you can um, if you were making Pilsner I think that's probably the only sort of beer I can think of where the water quality really matters um, otherwise it is a character of the beer that you make so 300 quid for control freaks and endless fun but the the actual price per pint once you've written off your your initial investment is the same sort of price as that of buying a kit it's just you've designed this yourself um, infinite variety so second time we've heard infinite before already I think today um, my infinite, maybe not quite so infinite. <laughs> um, yeast, uh, beer, four ingredients. Um, you know, as a, uh, any German will tell you, uh, it's barley, hops, yeast, and water. That's it. Um, however, there is variety in that. So this is from uh, a homebrew shop in Aldershot. I went through uh, their website. There are 22 types of barley that you can buy. 65 types of hops, which is a phenomenal amount of hops, um, 92 varieties of yeast, and uh, yes, you asked about water. I'm just using one type of water, but you could use more than that. Um, and uh, that gives 131,560, which is maybe not infinite, but given that 
if I live for 31,560 days, I'll be 86. Um, I think I'm doing quite well. If I was going to do a brew every day, that would take me to 360 years. So for practical purposes, as a, as a brewer who isn't brewing every day, um, I'm calling it infinite. And this uh, does not take into account that most beers are a mix of more than one barley and a mix of more than one hop as you go through. So the, the permutations increase dramatically. Um, the second point here, which you almost certainly can't read, says experimentation does not always delight. Um, so this... I, well, yes. <laughs> so I, I've... I've made, I've made beer, I've made cider. Um, in the last couple of years, I've made really nice cider, and then I tried adding mulberries to it and made really horrible cider. <laughs> um, my first beer of the year was meant to be uh, something akin to summer lightning, which uh, you may know is a hot back beer. Um, it was darker than any beer I've drunk in the last year, I should think. <laughs> It's very tasty, but not really what I was aiming for. But there, there, there is worse to it than that. So when I was 18-ish, when I first started brewing, my brother was very excitedly telling me about something called cock beer. Um, he was living in Germany, and he was saying, no, you chuck a chicken carcass into the brew, and uh, the protein is, uh, adds really good mouthfeel to it. If I'd been paying a bit more attention, I might have asked, do you cook the chicken carcass? <laughs> when, do you, when do you add it to the brew? Um, you take its feathers out. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so I was making a, a crab apple cider at the time, which was rather adventurous. And it's fair to say that I spent... Crab apple. Crab apple. Crab Not crab and crab apple. apple. No, no, no. So I, I spent... Yeah. <laughs> so I, I spent uh, two weeks of a Christmas uh, traveling very quickly between the bed and the loo, uh, usually successfully, um, and confounding doctors trying to work out what kind of poisoning I'd managed to give myself. So it, I'm pleased to say I've learned. Uh, I've learned a bit from them. Um, the, the key thing I've learned is when the stuff needs to be sterile. Um, so in our, in our process, mash being the first bit, sparging and then boiling, everything needs to be really clean. And as, yeah, I mean, if you can achieve sterile, great, but it needs to be at least clean. Once your brew has boiled, from that point onwards, everything needs to be sterile because otherwise you do get contamination. And if you chuck a raw chicken in there, <laughs> you, you can get worse than that. But I'm here to tell the tale. So. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yes. And also watching out if it if it smells like pear drops, it's probably not worth drinking. It, it, oh. oh dear. So I, I feel the tone has lowered already. Right. Um, here's my kit. Um, the mash tun looks remarkably like an ice cooler uh, because it is. Um, it's got a tap attached to it. Luckily, the people in Aldershot will show you one of those. Um, that holds 45 litres, so your grain goes in there and then you put water on top of that and then pour it off. You've got a kettle, which is where you do the boiling, and then the copper coil at the end is the wort cooler, which I will, um, as I take you through the process, explain what you do with that. Okay, um, so to make a beer, you pick your recipe. Um, the one I did uh, for this talk is Simmons Bitter. So Simmons was a brewery in Reading. Um, do you all know House of Fraser? No. Before House of Fraser, Simmons Brewery was there, and it stretches out sort of west of Reading along the canal. Um, it was... I wish I could give you a nice romantic story about it as a brewery, um, Basically, it wiped out a lot of other breweries locally. It was, you know, it was a, a capitalist success of the time. Um, and it was still going into the 1980s, I think. Sorry? I don't know the answer to that. 
Yeah. It's a fantastic group. Right, okay. And uh, I think they sell like, coffee and stuff like that too. Oh, interesting. The Simmons does have an outpost still going in Malta, but that's, that's the only one I know of. It is a bit too far. And the reviews of the beer are not complimentary. Um, but Simmon, Simmons Bitter is interesting because it was a prototype of IPA. So Simmons was one of the first breweries to introduce the IPA beer. And it had a huge contract with the British Navy for years, which is really how it, how it became such a success. Um, so I found a recipe, thanks to the powers of the internet. Um, it uses a mix of pale malt and amber malt. It uses two types of hops. It uses Fuggles hops to bitter it, which is what gives you the sort of back of mouth um, sharpness in a beer. And then Golding's hops uh, for finishing, which is what gives you the nice hoppy smell. Yes, they are, yes. Yeah, this, this, this was... So th this was a personal quest for me because I live in Reading. I wanted to use a Reading recipe um, because I, precisely because I'm using Reading water. And uh, the Y yeast, the yeast culture that I used is called Thames Valley. So it was as local as I could get to a Reading beer. You don't use the, uh, the term liquor for the raw water, the potential flavor, the brewers do. Uh, I don't, but give me a couple of years and I might. So I, I, re I reserve the right to become pretentious. Um, once, you, once you've got your recipe, uh, the magic of the internet again, uh, brew365.com has got a calculator on it. So you have to tell it how big a brew you're making. Um, you have to tell it the weight of the grain that you're using, um, what temperature it is, and various other things. And then it will tell you how much water you need to use and how hot the water has to be when you add it to the grain. Um, the downside of this and every other calculator I found is that everything is in American measures. So wh whereas I'm a, a metric person, they use gallons, but they use American gallons, which are not the same as UK gallons. And so I have had a couple of accidents in the brewing calculations, but um, I'm on top of it now. Um, so, get your grain. Here is some grain. I will pass it around this way. It's, uh, feel free to smell it um, if you want. I've also got some hops, which makes me look like a drug dealer. Um, feel free to smell that as well. Um, but you, you take the grain. So, um, most brews I use about five kilograms of, uh, of grain. Uh, the Simmons brew actually uses 7.6 kilograms of grain, so about 50% more than normal, um, which gives, gives you, uh, as a mouthfeel, it's akin to drinking milk, if you can imagine. Very nice, but, um, but thicker than normal. Uh, so you measure the temperature of the grain with a thermometer, and then you go to the website put in your calculations and uh, in this case you wait a considerable amount of time before you start pouring off the wort or wort I'm not sure what the answer is on that sorry okay so when I when I've done other brews and um, the sort of more modern ones you leave it for an hour this one required three hours um, which uh, well you'll see in a minute <laughs> um, is a is a reason why it took uh, why why there aren't some photos um sorry here i've got a video of boiling um i've mentioned time once um we've had a whole talk on time brewing so we've got costs of ingredients but the biggest cost is your time which as a student is obviously free because students don't understand the value of time but as an adult who earns money, um, time is the biggest element of it and who has only got a limited weekend. And I won't play this to you. This is only five minutes, but it takes forever and ever. What you've got is when you pour the stuff into the kettle, it builds up a froth. Um, the froth sits there taunting you for hours and hours until eventually it starts to break through and you get a bubbling thing going on. I'm really pleased, sorry everybody, this is just personal geekery, that I've actually got a video working here. I don't think I've ever seen one. So, <laughs> so I feel quite chuffed with that. 
And then soon, hopefully, the uh, bubbling will give way and you'll actually see the colour of the beer come through. And you can cheer or not. Or we'll get bored of waiting. Hey! I just do it for my own pleasure. Okay, so cooling is the next thing that happens. And um, yes, as I say, it took me three hours to mash it. You have to boil it for 90 minutes. During that boil, you stick in the hops. Um, that goes, the bittering hops stay in there throughout the whole boil. The finishing hops only go in for the last 10 minutes. Otherwise, the... Um, the sort of ar aromatic bits break down in the boil and, and you lose it. Um, it did mean that I was uh, cooling the wort in the dark, so I haven't got any photos of that because reading at night is not that pretty. But what you do is you, you plug this end of the, the hose into a tap. That end of the hose goes into the stuff that you've made dirty with all your grain and the copper coil actually goes into the brew bin and it it's just works like a heat exchange. So it, it brings the temperature of the work down to 22 degrees is what you're aiming for from boiling. Um, and the reason for doing it quickly is uh, all to do with something called dimethyl sulfide. There you go, geeks, a chemical, um, which is an off smell that you don't want in your beer. Uh, and the longer the work stays hot, the more of that builds up. Um, hello, Mark. Second reason as well it is uh, lactic acid bacterial growth. Yes. Sorry. Yes, no, you're right. Um, I don't know all the uh, answers to these things. I have to say I've started taking it seriously in this last year um, and uh, I'm enjoying it. But yes, I, I believe there is a number of, a number of reasons. Um, once it's down at the right temperature, you add the yeast, you stick a lid on it, and uh, then you leave it. And after 24 hours, if you're lucky, so this is my brew bin here. Um, there is normally a lid on top of it. This is a, an aquatic um, thermostat heater thing, uh, just to keep the temperature constant. You don't need that in the summer, um, but in the winter it's useful, and when the nights get cold it's useful. So after about 24 hours, you get a horrendous frothing coming up, which is the yeast coming to life. Um, and then you wait until that's called croison. You wait for that to die down. It falls back into the wort, and it's about seven to ten days. And then you get the the actual colour of the beer. And at that point, you are ready uh, to start bottling. Sterilising is obviously very important, as everybody knows. Um, there's this amazing powder called VWP that seems to do the job very well and very easily. So you sterilise all your bottles. Um, you siphon your beer into them. Um, I've got for my birthday this magic wand thing that is a tube with a little plastic plunger on the end. Um, that so as the beer comes down, it pushes the or sorry, the plunger sits at the bottom of the bottle and is pushed up, so the beer flows out. And as soon as you lift it from the bottom, the plunger drops and it seals the tube, so you don't get any spillage. Which is, which is great because it's tidier and more beer. Um, and then you cap it at the end uh, using this amazing claw thing. And uh, that's sort of it. You've got your beer bottled. Um, you obviously have to label your beer, otherwise every beer looks the same and you'll never know what it is you've made. Um, so we've, we've been using paper and some stamps to actually, uh, actually label the beer. And, oh yeah, yeah, then you wait, because time is a real pressure. Um, so for modern beers, again, you need to wait kind of two, three weeks. It's really not worth, despite the temptation, and I fail every time, <laughs> it's really not worth trying it early. Uh, it is better to wait. Um, this particular beer I've made, uh, Simmons beer, you've got to wait three months. Um, so... That might be one reason why it's not sold anymore. I don't know. But um, you do wait forever. And I, I guess while you're waiting, you can contemplate various things. So I mull over the idea of uh, making a calculator about water and temperature that would work in the UK with UK, um, you know, UK measures. So it's still an IPA, so it's not literally being shipped to India and things. Yeah, so it's fine on a boat. I guess it can mature on the way. 
Um, I, I think about a slicker process. So my, my process is not bad. It's actually quite neat. But the thing that annoys me is the amount of water I waste. Um, so I'm with the work cooler, the, the water that comes out, the hot water that comes out, I use for cleaning. But you use it, it sort of uses an, an awful lot of water. And I'm trying to think of a way that I can actually conserve the water and reuse it. Um, I think it would be better if I could do that. Uh, in the future, we are thinking about beer for cheese because um, we've also learnt to make cheese. Uh, so, and the two do go really well together. So we've, I've got this idea of um, beer with rosemary in it as well as hops and maybe a goat's cheese might work really nicely. So that, that's something that we're, we're thinking of trying. And, you know, and with other food as well. But obviously, beer and cheese is the food of athletes, like myself. Um, Commercialising. So that's a, a common dream. Um, I've looked at it. I don't like the idea. Um, what I really enjoy about brewing is, is the variety and the excitement. And you never really know what it is that you're going to make. Although you can design, you know, design quite well for things like alcohol content and the actual batch size and things like that. You don't really know what it's going to taste like until it's made. <coughs> and I like that about it. And if I was going to commercialize it, that, that would go away because people want consistency. You know, you don't, you don't want a different pint every week, unless, unless maybe I had a pub where you just came and drank whatever it was I was knocking up and you stay up. Yeah, that's right. But you've got to stay away when I go, I've got this great chicken beer. <laughs> <laughs> That wouldn't work. Um, so I've kind of gone against commercialising it. Um, I don't know, we'll see. I suppose I could sort of do a kind of Apple launch, you know, about being really excited that I've got this brand new beer and it's revolutionising beer. It's just not really for me. Growing my own hops, though, is for me because, again, that's a local thing. And we, we've tried uh, to grow our hops this year um, with, with some success. Um, but there's this thing called a comma butterfly, um, which has been in decline for decades because of the decline in the hop farming world. However, not in our garden anymore. So we, we planted them, this spiky little bugger. It, I mean, it's a very pretty little hop, uh, little caterpillar, but it lives on hops. And uh, as you can see, it eats hop leaves and then it makes a chrysalis. So it'll be back next year, no doubt. So there, there are some pests, there's some competition for the, for the hops, but I'm hoping that, that you know, maybe next year we can grow some hops. Um, with hops, it, yeah, but I didn't know these things existed, Ashton. So now I know, next year, there will be nets. Um, although there's, there's a, a slightly sorry tale with hops as well, because in, in the commercial world, they only keep the, the female hop plants because um, if they get fertilized and go to seed, then it's really bad for the, for the beer. I'm not sure why. Um, but so every um, hop farm, actually, rather than planting individual plants, it, it takes clones of a, of, a, of a plant. So we've grown some hops now. We don't know whether they're males or females. We're going to watch. Uh, I guess we'll, the ones with willies will kill off, and uh, and the next beer will be called Herod or something like that. <laughs> so, <laughs> so um, that's that's it, uh, really. I'd like to invite anyone who's interested. We're going to do a brew day at my house, uh, October the twenty fifth. Uh, chances are it's going to be some sort of Christmas brew that we're going to make. You're welcome to come along. You're welcome to join in. Um, I would advise you, obviously, to drink sensibly, as every, every good beer advert does. Um, drink sensibly means going to good pubs. Uh, there are so many good pubs in Reading. Uh, I've just mentioned the Hop Leaf, which is our local, uh, which does uh, hot, uh, summer lightning, and the Grey Fryer, which is down by the train station, relatively new. Uh, very good beer there, and they really look after their beer there. But there are plenty of uh, good beer pubs in Reading, so there's no excuse not to go to one. 
Um, if you want to buy your own beer, the Grumpy Goat. Has anyone been there in Harris Arcade? So it's uh, two women who run that. They sell beer and cheese. Hello. It's heaven. Um, and there's the link to the homebrew shop uh, for anyone who's interested. Um, Is there? It's actually quite decent, but maybe not as good as yours, but yeah. Um, in Whitley Woods in the middle round, the roundabout, where the roundabout is. Is there really? Yeah. yeah. That's probably about 10 minutes away from where I live. Yeah. <laughs> so as I say, I'm learning. Um, I have brought some beer. <laughs> so, um, in honour of uh, Geek Night, it is called Geek Brew. Um, this is the Simmons beer, so it won't be ready until Christmas, so you can't drink it tonight. But there are 15 bottles here, and any of you who wants one is welcome to have it. Um, it's 6.7%, so it's quite, <laughs> quite strong. But as I say, it's a prototype IPA, and they made it back in the day quite strong because it had to withstand a lot of travel, and the hops and the alcohol help keep it fresh. So there is no chicken involved whatsoever, no. But that said, it's a gift. You are welcome to take it entirely at your own risk. Thank you very much.